Hey, it's Seth. And Molly. And do we have news for you. Big Picture Science is now on Patreon. Patreon makes it easy for you to donate any amount to the radio show. So join us now, please, at patreon.com slash bigpicturescience. And this is news for you because after choosing a monthly giving level, you can sit back, open a cold one, and reap the rewards. Because not only do you keep the radio show going, which is reward in itself, but each giving level comes with an extra perk. For example, you might get bonus content, the opportunity to participate in polls that will help guide future episodes, hearing your name read aloud during the credits, or even meet Seth virtually, that is. <laughs> I'm not sure you would want that, but here's the thing. Patreon makes supporting content you like, such as this radio show slash podcast, easy. For $5 a month, for example, you'll get exclusive content. And it's easy to sign up at patreon.com slash bigpicturescience. I know because I just did it. And I can tell you the hardest bit of it was proving that you're not a robot. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that, Molly. Honestly, we appreciate your support. Because we couldn't do the show without you. Just mosey on over to patreon.com slash bigpicturescience. Thank you. Thank you. Do I worry? I don't worry as much as I did when I was a kid. I was trying to fit in with the other kids, but I didn't play sports. I'd go away to summer camp and all the other kids were playing baseball all day and I was back in the bunkhouse wiring up some electronics. When I was in high school, all the really nifty girls were interested in the football players. I couldn't play football. I didn't even understand the rules. Well, I've learned that worrying about all that stuff was kind of misplaced. There were other things I should have worried more about, like my academics. And those football players, well, they've developed all sorts of other problems, like uh, with their knees. I'm not going to worry about that particular problem anymore. I'm Seth Shostak. Poisonous snakes, a bolt of lightning, a rogue rock from space. There are plenty of things that might cause you to wring your hands, but are you fretting about the right ones? Statistically speaking, for example, stepping out of the bathtub is more dangerous than flying, but no one signs up for fear of showering classes. I'm Molly Bentley. This is Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. In this episode, what's really worth worrying about, what things you can give a pass to, and why it's hard for us to tell the difference. Plus, why highly intelligent people are more susceptible to irrational decision-making. It's our regular look at critical thinking, skeptic check, worrier mentality. It's a scary world out there, so be careful. Let's bring you the latest on the ongoing E. coli outbreak that is- Swarming bees attacked a landscaping crew. One person was killed. NASA is launching a study of a so-called Armageddon asteroid name. Breaking today. news from Wall Street, a steep drop in the stock market today. The Dow is down. The media do stoke our fears because many events that happen are horrific, even though they don't happen very often. And one example might be a shark attack. Even though these events are very unlikely to happen and there's less than 100 deaths a year to sharks, because they're very emotional and horrific, they really have a large impact on people. That doesn't mean that there isn't stuff to worry about. Normal worry is a good thing. It helps us uh, balance our lives. It helps us predict and create behaviors to protect ourselves. It's when worry becomes excessive and makes a significant effect on our behavior that it becomes a problem. But what keeps you up at night can range from concerns about a child's health or how to pay the mortgage to the possibility of an asteroid strike. So. How do we sort out the reasonable worries from those that just consume a bunch of adrenaline? My name is Eric Chudler. I'm a research associate professor in the Department of Bioengineering at the University of Washington. There's three things people should pay attention to. Uh, the first thing is how likely is something going to happen. If it's unlikely to happen, maybe you shouldn't worry about it so much. The second thing is it preventable. If it's something that you can do about, then you need to take steps and you should worry about taking care of those things and preparing for that eventuality. And the third thing is, how likely is it to cause harm? If it's something that will cause bodily injury, uh, death, or the loss of limb, uh, then it's something that you should worry about. So those three things, likely to happen, how preventable is it, and how likely is it to cause severe damage? 
Dr. Chudler is a co-author along with Lise Johnson, a biomedical engineer and assistant professor at Rocky Vista University of Worried, Science Investigates Some of Life's Common Concerns. Lise, your book is a kind of laundry list of 58 common worries, from mobile phones to toys made in China to, well, meat. And you give your findings as graphs that indicate uh, their consequences, in other words, how dangerous they are, their probability, what's the chance that this is going to bother you, and three, how easy it is to avoid them, like, I don't know, in the case of meat becoming a vegan. Now, you rank flesh-eating bacteria as a big circle, meaning it, it could kill you, but low worry index. Uh, in the case of the flesh-eating bacteria, why was that? Well, flesh-eating bacteria are very problematic if you get an infection, but the number of people that have flesh-eating bacteria infections every year is really low, especially compared to the number of people that are exposed to bacteria. Okay, so in other words, your chances of dying from that are probably less than, you know, dying as you drive to work. Oh, for sure. Now, you write that, for example, while shark attacks account for a few deaths per year in the U.S., medical errors are the third leading cause of death in the country. What sort of errors are we talking about here? Well, I should clarify and say they could be up to the third leading cause of death. They're very hard to estimate because they're not tracked very well. And medical errors encompasses just a huge array of different things. It could be anything from not washing your hands properly if you're a medical provider to amputating the wrong leg to leaving a surgical instrument or a sponge inside an incision. I see. Okay, so we actually don't know, but I mean, they're certainly up there. I mean, there are plenty of people who go to the hospital and you know, complain that they get pneumonia there. I've, I've certainly got pneumonia when I've been in the hospital. I mean, it does seem like a, a dangerous place. I think that you're definitely more likely to get sick when you're in a hospital. I think that might be a slightly different category. That's more of a hospital-acquired infection issue than it is of, a, of an actual medical error. But both of those things are actually big problems. Let's look at some uh, some other cases. How worried should we be or how worried are we about an asteroid slamming into the Earth? Well, I don't know how worried you are. Uh, Some people are certainly very concerned about the idea of an asteroid strike. And I think if there were an asteroid strike and it was a large asteroid, then that would certainly be problematic. It could be an extinction event for us. But we sort of recommend that it's not really worth worrying about, at least for the average person. There's really not a lot that you can do about an asteroid potentially striking Earth. So you could spend your time better worrying about something else. What's the most worrisome thing from your point of view? It's going to be context dependent, but I can tell you that I was much more worried about lead after I wrote the book than I was before. And even though I knew that lead was problematic, I didn't really sort of understand how problematic it could be. And actually, when we moved from Seattle to Colorado recently, I was very emphatic that we were going to buy a house that was built after 1979 because I just didn't want to have any lead paint anywhere in our house. We have small kids and I just didn't want to think about it at all. So you were worried about lead paint, which was used before the 1970s routinely. What was the worry about lead in in particular? Well, lead has been used in lots of different places historically. Way back in Roman times, they used it actually to sweeten their wine because lead acetate is sweet, which is, you know, I think an exceptionally bad idea in retrospect. Lead is extremely neurotoxic. And even though lead paint hasn't been used in residential construction since 1979, there are lots and lots of buildings that were built before 1979. Schools and hospitals and homes. We know that there's lots of legacy lead in the dirt from leaded gasoline. So if you're thinking about growing a garden, you need to make sure that you don't have lead in your soil, especially if your home is older and could have been painted with lead paint. As it weathers, that lead gets into the soil. And then you track it into your home, you grow your vegetables in it, and you consume it that way. So I think that we do have this idea that lead paint was outlawed a long time ago, and so it's no longer a problem. But You know, where I live, people are renovating their homes all the time. And if you have a home that was built before 1979, you almost certainly have lead paint. And lead paint dust is something you should take seriously. Is there any evidence that uh, society is prone to worry about the wrong things? I don't know that I have any strong statistical evidence that society is worrying about the wrong things. I have a lot of empirical evidence about society worrying about the wrong things. You know, I have little kids and I run with a lot of moms. And we're all worried about all kinds of exposures. And some of them are maybe problematic like lead and some of them are not problematic like fluoride. But I think that when I talk to other people, they tend to be more focused on fluoride than they are on lead. And that's exactly the opposite of what it should be. 
when we consider medical things, uh, antibiotic resistance is high on your list. There's been a lot of reporting on the fact that we're running out of, you know, effective antibiotics because we continue to take them for things like viruses where they don't do anything. We give them to livestock and so forth. You know, these messages don't seem to get through to the public. What's the problem? You know, that's really interesting. I work at a medical school and I ha- I teach physician assistant students who are very bright students, very understanding of all of the issues that are related to antibiotics and antibiotic overuse. And I still have students that tell me, you know, I started to get sick. I can't afford to be sick. I went to the doctor and I got an antibiotic right away. So I think that, you know, even people that know about the problems are prone to that sort of desire to have a quick fix. I think the idea of antibiotic resistance is scary, but it feels really distant. And because it feels like it's a long way off, there's this idea that somehow that problem will be solved before it really comes to fruition. I think what people don't realize is that the antibiotic resistant age is already here. We've already had people die in the United States in the hospital of sepsis because we can't cure their bacterial infection with any approved antibiotics in the United States. You know, it's trendy these days to blame stuff on uh, the spread of social media or the fact that everybody carries, you know, the world's information around in their pockets and so forth. To what extent does the fact that we're all, if you will, connected, you know, have on on these kinds of worries, the things that people, uh, you know, get into a huff about? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think it's problematic that we have so much information at our disposal. I think the problem is that we have so much misinformation that's being spread around. And when I, I was writing this book, I saw a lot of blogs where people very earnestly were just misunderstanding and misrepresenting scientific evidence and scientific data, not really understanding where that evidence came from or how it fits within the scope of larger study. And I think that's problematic is that we have just a reduced sense of appreciation for people's expertise and everybody's opinion seems to be as valid as everybody else's opinion and that I think is problematic. Lise Johnson, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you. Lise Johnson is a biomedical engineer and an assistant professor at Rocky Vista University. Well, Eric, worries can really seize hold of our brain. What's going on in the brain when we worry? Yeah, so there are several parts of the brain that are very important for worry, for fear, and for anxiety. Uh, Deep in the brain, there's a set of structures called the limbic system. Uh, There's a number of different areas, including the amygdala, the hippocampus, the hypothalamus. Uh, Those are some of the areas that are very active during emotional behavior. They send information to the part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is involved with decision making, planning, problem solving. And it kind of is a way to analyze what's going on with our emotions. And worry seems to affect that prefrontal cortex and it kind of interferes with our ability to analyze those emotions. And sometimes that emotional behavior can override some of those more logical uh, decision-making processes. So the part of the brain that registers anxiety and fear, this limbic system, can kind of hijack the part of the brain that is supposed to be making rational decisions for us. That's right. The prefrontal cortex uh, tries to make decisions based on the information it's getting from the limbic system. It also seems that worry might actually interfere with the prefrontal cortex ability to deal with distractions. And so because it can't deal with all these distractions, it has a more difficult time making a decision about what to do. But sometimes we can keep things in perspective. We may have a rational worry, like concerned about the health of a child, and have an irrational one that we, an alien invasion or something, and we're able to dismiss the irrational one. But sometimes we're not able to dismiss it. Why is that? Well, part of it is that to the brain, even that irrational worry seems real. So I don't know of any data to suggest that the brain is responding any differently to a rational worry versus an irrational worry, because to the individual, that worry is real. Well, finally, Eric, it can be very hard to stop worrying, even if you know rationally that the chances of whatever happening are very slim. Logic and facts don't always help. Why don't they help? 
Yeah, that's very, very true. Oftentimes, people look for information that confirms their belief. And you may have heard of that as a, a confirmation bias. And by finding pieces of information that confirm what somebody already believes can really give them a boost and can really reward them. Well, things that are contrary to their beliefs can threaten them, can threaten their own personal beliefs, can threaten their entire social structure. Can you give an example? Well, maybe that the, the shark example. So if someone is afraid of sharks and they see a news article about uh, a shark attack, that confirms their belief that sharks are dangerous. While they'll ignore all the other data suggesting that the likelihood of getting bitten or attacked by a shark are very low. So by having that piece of that one piece of information gives them a boost and rewards their own belief system so that they'll ignore other data to the contrary. Well, Eric, is there anything that you're worried about right now that you wish you could stop worrying about? Uh, just the next meeting I have to get to. <laughs> okay. Well, you can control that meeting a little bit. Maybe it's not preventable, but good luck in that meeting, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Eric Chudler is a research associate professor in the Department of Bioengineering at the University of Washington, and he is the executive director of the Center for Neurotechnology. His book with Lise Johnson is Worried, Science Investigates Some of Life's Common Concerns. So, Seth, do worries keep you up at night? Of course they do. Yes, they do. What keeps me up are things about work. And I don't think I'm unusual in that sense. I don't think that that's odd. But it's kind of frustrating because I know that lying there, tossing and, you know, flipping the pillow back and forth, I mean, that's not going to help. That's going to make things worse because I'll be sleepy the next day. Do you think being a scientist and being a, an astronomer specifically has you worrying more or less about natural disaster events like a asteroid impact? You know, as an astronomer, I don't actually worry much about astronomical threats, even though there are plenty. I mean, the universe is out to get you, and I know that, and eventually it will get us. But on the other hand, it's, it's I, I have some idea of the of the magnitude of the threat. So I'm not worried about the sun going bad in another five billion years. When the sun goes bad, that sounds like a, a science fiction film. Well, it could be a family problem. I mean, a lot of suns <laughs> go bad. <laughs> There's that. Yeah. And that's something someone might worry about. Yes, oh, I'm sure bad. many people do. Not too many people worry about the sun going bad because, uh, <laughs> you know, it's so far in the future. It's like trilobites worrying about the asteroid that took out the dinosaurs. Not their problem. Later in the show, are you caught in the intelligence trap? Find out how the brainiest among us overestimate their ability to make judgment calls about threats. But uh, first, okay, we've been talking about shark attacks here, and maybe you're worried about a shark attack, but did you realize that the chances of being offed by an alligator, roughly one in 50 million, are roughly three times more likely than that you'll be killed by a shark? Those are the probabilities. I hope that reassures you. I ran into a guy who said that he really didn't like to fly because it was so dangerous. And this is honest to God truth. He was standing next to his motorcycle smoking a cigarette. Why statistics don't always lessen our worries. Next, it's our look at critical thinking skeptic check. This episode, Worrier Mentality on Big Picture Science. Hi, it's me again, reminding you that Big Picture Science is now on Patreon. So if you join now, you can become a dolphin. That's right. I mean, it makes perfect sense, particularly if you like fish. If you give $20 a month, you become a dolphin. And if what Seth and I are talking about isn't intuitive, well, find out what we're talking about at patreon.com slash bigpicturescience. But what if I want a little more fang for the buck, Molly? Can I become a, a velociraptor? Yes, you can, Seth. I didn't know that they had fangs. <laughs> well, most of them don't, but, you know, some have had dental work. Well, for $10 a month, you can be a velociraptor. $5 a month grants you the title of tardigrade. It's pretty simple, really. And how would you compare the benefits of being a velociraptor versus a tardigrade versus a dolphin? Well... <laughs> 
<laughs> well, the benefits, two of them are still around. But when it comes to Patreon, there are different rewards at different amounts. So if you become any of them, for example, you get bonus material, which is exclusive to Patreon supporters. But go to patreon.com slash big picture science and find out what the other benefits are. Okay, but is there a minimum amount? Well, for $2 a month, you get the satisfaction of knowing that you keep the mics on at Big Picture Science and you get to participate in polls. Those supporters must be protozoa, elementary life, or, or maybe just the first life. That's right, protozoa. But whatever you can spare each month, it helps us out a lot, and we are grateful. So please head over to patreon.com slash bigpicturescience and sign up. It's easy, it's fun, and best of all, it keeps Big Picture Science going. So thank you. I, I've always wanted to be a velociraptor. Well, you can be, Seth, at $10 a month. <laughs> Just go to patreon.com slash bigpicturescience. From asteroid strikes to antibiotic resistance to lead paint, those are some of the big threats that we've measured on the worryometer meter in this episode of Skeptic Check here on Big Picture Science as we look at irrational and rational worries. In other words, which ones are worth popping antacid and which are better to, to forget about because they're extremely unlikely or simply beyond your control? You can do something about lead paint, for example, but you need to leave a killer rock from the outer solar system, that problem, to NASA. We've also heard that our brains hold on to worries, so they're not easy to shake off. But another reason they're hard to shake is that it's hard to put things in perspective, and that has to do with our misunderstanding of statistics. My name is Willie Turner, and I'm the Vice President of Operations at the Hiller Aviation Museum in San Carlos. Airline travel is the safest transportation in the world. It's gotten so safe that I guess they don't even rate it by safety anymore. And there's the statistics you can throw out there that the safest mode of transportation is 0 0.07 deaths per billion miles traveled per passenger miles. You know, they have these new programs that anybody can pull up on their app called like FlightAware. And it's just amazing to see how many airplanes are in the air at any given time, and you don't hear of accidents. You know, that number, I, I don't know what that is, but I assume it's uh, on the order of a few tens of thousands per day? Yeah, tens of thousands of flights uh, throughout the world, but yeah, even in the U.S. I don't know the exact number on that, but it is extremely high. Okay, and what about something else that always seems to uh, kind of concern passengers? You, you look out the window and you see the wings flexing occasionally, particularly when you're hitting turbulence. Uh, naively, you might think, well, gosh, you know, if that keeps up, maybe the wing will break off. Right, yeah, that, that is uh, some people don't want to sit by the window because of that to look out. I'm a, actually a pilot, so uh, I always want to sit by the window because, I mean, it's an amazing to think that you're sitting in an aircraft at 30,000 feet and flying across the country. It's just such an amazing feeling. But, yeah, they, they were designed to do that. The wings are designed to take the stresses, and the, the actual flexing is a good thing. They don't want a rigid situation because if it was rigid, it would even be more turbulent and airplanes fly through turbulence every single day all throughout the country somewhere. The pilots are aware of it. They know how to do it. The aircraft are designed for it. And uh, so it isn't turbulence that are going to bring down the airplane. So, indeed, all those turbulent uh, moments during flights are actually nothing to worry about. They're just maybe uncomfortable. Uh, they're uncomfortable to some and to others. You know, the, they like the the, uh, the roller coaster aspect of the ride. <laughs> it, it can be kind of fun. But when they're really turbulent, that's true. It's just uncomfortable, and it's a little nerve-wracking. But the old statement says, you know, the most dangerous part of your flight is the trip to and from the airport. I'll try to be less anxious. Willie Turner, thanks so very much for speaking with us. You bet. Willie Turner is vice president of operations at the Hiller Aviation Museum, and he's a pilot. His statistics about flight should assuage the nervous Nelly flyers out there. After all, he said that the death rate was 0.07 deaths per billion traffic miles. Now you can convert that, and let's assume you spend all day, every day in an airplane. You never get off in the course of a, a lifetime. Your chances of being in an accident are still only 2%. Even in cases where the numbers are meant to reassure, they don't always. Charles Whelan is a senior lecturer and policy fellow at Dartmouth College, and he has long recognized this, and that led him to strip the percentages bare a few years back for his book called Naked Statistics. As someone who lectures on public policy, 
he knows that a better understanding of studies and surveys could help us see things rationally, although it often doesn't work that way. Charles, we hear a lot from aviation experts about how safe it is to fly. I mean, it's safer than driving to the airport. So we have that data, we have the statistics, but some people are still afraid to fly. Why don't the statistics reassure those folks? Well, it's unlikely that they've read in the newspaper about all the car accidents that happened last week around the world, let alone all the motorcycle accidents, which is even more dangerous than being in a car. But it's almost certain that they read about the two Boeing 737 Supermax accidents. So in our minds, we think a lot about air disasters, in part because they're so rare, which is what makes them newsworthy, even though quietly and all around the world, other forms of transportation are much, much, much more dangerous. But let me tell you a little story about something that happened in New Hampshire. When I was working on Naked Statistics, I ran into a guy who said, similar to what we're talking about, that he really didn't like to fly because it was so dangerous. And this is honest to God truth. He was standing next to his motorcycle smoking a cigarette. And obviously, most people would know that motorcycles and cigarettes, the latter almost certain to kill you if you smoke long enough, are much more dangerous than flying. Okay, so it's clear that people don't grasp statistics. Why is that? I mean, what is it about statistics that makes them so scary? Is it just that it's higher math? Well, in some ways, they have a better grasp than we may know. People are pretty good at patterns, and statistics are just patterns. So if, for example, you walk into the gymnasium and four guys who are all over six foot eight walk past you, you're going to think something unusual is going on, and maybe it's basketball or volleyball. And the reason you're going to assume that is because there's a pattern. Lots of tall people, abnormally tall, and you make an inference about what that pattern may be. That is really what statistics is. That We do the same when we look, for example, at whether people eating broccoli live longer or not. We're looking for something in the data that tells us some larger lesson. And by much people are better at that than we think. Now, on the other hand... There are lots of little foibles that people make, such as not understanding whether things are related or not. So if I flip a coin and it comes up three heads in a row, people may erroneously say, oh, now it's time for a tails, not appreciating that each flip is independent of the other. There are little things like that that can make a big difference when people are interpreting numbers. But by and large, at a gut level, they may understand more than we think. Well, Charles, I've got to ask you this, because you seem to have empathy for people who resist the math involved in statistics. You wrote a book about statistics called Naked Statistics, and one chapter describes why you hated calculus but loved statistics. I mean, they're just both branches of math. You know, what what was the difference? What, What is some sort of perverse reaction here? Well, we were talking about this in the studio before we started, actually. Statistics is really powerful. It can tell us about how we can be healthier. It can help you if you're a sports enthusiast. It can help us if we're trying to make better schools. Are charter schools actually improving student performance or not? I looked around the world and I saw statistics answering, or at least informing, a lot of the questions that I really cared about. Whereas when I was in high school being drubbed with calculus, even though it is really important later in life, whether you want to send rockets out into space or understand economics, nobody in high school was connecting the dots for me. Whereas with statistics, I learned in such a way that it opened up horizons and made a lot of things that I cared about elsewhere more understandable. Statistics help us figure out what causes what. And this is at the core of how everybody makes decisions. You know, everything from, uh, what was that sound? It must be a bear, to the the cause and effect of uh, various health studies. How do statistics factor into our continuous search for what causes what? Well, it's a mixed blessing because statistics, when you look at lots of data, first and foremost, finds an association between two things. We'll look at millions of observations of data. Maybe we're looking at death records or a big survey of nurses. There are lots of famous longitudinal surveys which may collect data on people over a long period of time. There's the famous Framingham Health Study where the people in Framingham, Massachusetts, including their children and ultimately their grandchildren, were surveyed and questioned every year about their health and their diet. Blood was drawn. They were weighed and measured. And from that, we can start to draw connections between their behaviors, what they eat, diet, and so on, and health outcomes that we care about. A lot of the insights into heart disease, for example, come from that Framingham study. But there's an important limit, 
which is to say when we're looking at data, all we're seeing is a connection between two things. So for example, we may find that people who take short breaks at work and go outside for five or six minutes are more likely to die young. And you say, wow, you know, that's dangerous. I'm going to stay inside at work and we want to warn people against taking short breaks. But of course, all you're doing is missing something, which is the people who go outside for their short breaks are probably taking smoking breaks. And it's the cigarettes that end up killing you. So you have to be very cautious about when you find an association between two things, whether one is really causing the other. This confusion between correlation and causation, I mean, that happens a lot, right? I mean, pitchers, for example, might take their lucky sock, with, and they might wear a lucky sock, I don't know, they carry it with them, you know, into a game, and then they win, and then they figure, okay, my lucky sock was essential, and they won't go into a game without their lucky sock. Right. And in that case, you know, why not? There's not a real cost to changing your socks or not changing your socks. So you might as well go with a sock that won. In other cases, it is more dangerous and can be quite misleading. So, for example, if you read a study that says eating a lot of organic kale is really good for your health, what you want to do is drill down and say, all right, well, how is that actually being ascertained? It's unlikely that it's experimental. And we should point out that kind of the gold standard of research is a randomized trial where you take half of a large sample and say, all right, you're gonna eat kale every day. And the other half, randomly chosen, so they may just pick numbers or something like that. You're not gonna eat any kale at all or you'll eat less than the other group. And then days or weeks or even years later, we compare their health. It's very hard to require one group to eat kale and prevent the other. So instead, what we'll do is we'll just gather information on people's eating habits and we'll compare in the survey those who eat a lot of kale to the health outcomes of those who don't. But the problem is people who eat organic kale are not like other people. To begin with, they probably have more disposable income, they may live in different places, they may have higher education. And we don't know whether it's the kale that's causing the better health or the other attributes that are associated with eating kale. So can statistics help us sort that out? It can be part of the answer, but it can suggest a pattern worth following up. So, for example, if you find that there's some positive association between eating kale and health outcomes, then you might turn to the biologists and say, can you tell us something that might be causal here? What is it about? And they say, well, yes, there's a lot of iron, and we found that leafy vegetables ha are, have important fiber elements and so on. If they can then provide a biological basis that supports what we're seeing with the data, then you have one more step in the right direction. For those of a certain age, you may remember that for a long time, the cigarette industry fought the belief that cigarettes caused cancer and incidentally, the cigarettes were addictive. They were preying on this fact that sometimes it's hard to prove causality when there's association, but ultimately, through different methodologies, none of which were experimental, you can't force people to smoke, and biological evidence and looking at the cellular impact of the components of cigarette smoke on cells and so on, we were able to make the case conclusively that cigarettes cause cancer, but we couldn't do it alone with just the statistical data. Now, one thing that we deal with every day is surveys. I mean, I, I see them on the news almost every night. There's some poll that says 53% of respondents say that, I don't know, using your cell phone is dangerous, and another 47% who say it isn't. So you think, okay, it must be dangerous. But if they've only surveyed maybe 500 people, then you expect that the random uncertainty is 5%, which completely reverses the conclusion. It is, this seems very common to me. Well, there are a lot of potential pitfalls with surveys. There's nothing wrong with the methodology, which is to say that if we contact a representative sample of some larger population, say the entire voting U.S. public, we can't call all 30 or 50 million households, but we're curious about how they feel about the performance of the government or certain political candidates and so on. It is legitimate to say if we were to reach out and get a subset of them that were representative of the larger whole, then that subset should look like the rest of the population. The best way to get your mind around this is if you're cooking a bowl of soup, a big large pot of soup on the stove, you don't need a whole bowl full to know whether it needs more salt. You just take a little spoonful, literally a sample, and that will tell you whether the whole pot needs more salt. The problem is that spoonful had better be representative of the rest of the pot, and there are a whole bunch of social phenomena right now that are making it harder than ever to get an accurate sample of the American population. It sounds uh, somewhat understandable then why the public is wary. I mean, 
I think Mark Twain, and he may have been quoting Benjamin Disraeli, about misrepresentation, saying there were lies, damned lies, and statistics, putting statistics in the uh, bottom category there. Uh, it, it sounds like people are afraid that statistics are used to manipulate them and to make them worry about things that, you know, they really shouldn't worry about. Well, I think there's a lot to be concerned about. There are people who make honest mistakes just because they're limitations to the data or they get a strange result. But it is also true statistics don't lie, but people lie with statistics, especially in the realm of politics, in the realm of places where people have a self-interest in promoting something. Finally, Charles, how would you suggest helping people become friends with statistics? I mean, how do we deal with trying to decide what to worry about? The first is to be less afraid, honestly. Statistics, as I said at the outset, is just patterns, and people are familiar with patterns. If it rains this morning, it's probably likely to rain this afternoon. Why? Because those things are correlated. You see the same kind of patterns elsewhere. I think the second thing is that when you read the newspaper and someone purports to say that eating broccoli or red spinach or whatever the latest hot health trend is, read down. That's usually paragraph one. That's the headline. In paragraph four or five, they're going to tell you the methodology, which is just a fancy way of saying how is it that they came to this conclusion. And you don't have to be a scientist to understand that some of those methodologies are better than others. Was this a controlled experiment carried out at the Harvard School of Public Health? Or was this a survey done of regular broccoli eaters done by the Broccoli Growers Association? I would feel much more comfortable about the former than the latter. So you should look at those kinds of things. And then last, just try and pay attention to the magnitude of risk. So I don't know what the probability of getting attacked by a shark is. But if I'm going to South Africa, where there are great white sharks, I do know that it's a lot more dangerous to be in a moving vehicle without a seatbelt than it is to be swimming at the beach at Cape Town. I do know that it's a lot more dangerous to be outside without sunscreen, if you do it over and over again, than it is to fly in a plane. And so try and pay attention to the, the magnitude of the risk, because at the end of the day, that's most likely to have an impact on your life. Charles Whelan, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Well, thank you for having me. Charles Whelan is a senior lecturer and policy fellow at Dartmouth College, and he is the author of Naked Statistics. It's my understanding that 11 out of 10 people don't understand statistics. Well, if that's your understanding, that says something about your understanding of statistics, I guess, Molly. <laughs> I love that joke. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of statistics jokes. It is understandable to me why statistics trip some people up. It's hard to make sense of percentages sometimes. Well, give me an example of that, because percentages seem like the easiest thing to understand. If somebody gives you probabilities or stuff like that, that I can imagine is a little bit more difficult. But if somebody says 80% of Americans believe that, you know, uh, smoking is probably good for you, I mean, you would understand the percentage. <laughs> yeah, it is true. But I suppose if you heard something like, well, 11% of the time you go skateboarding, there's a 50% chance that you'll get hurt. Well, I have to admit that is slightly <laughs> confusing. It's hard to figure out exactly how how, how careful you should be uh, when skateboarding, but I think you should always be careful when skateboarding. <laughs> All right, were you a precocious prodigy, a Mensa marvel? Do you consider the Nobel Prize low-hanging fruit? Well, your big brain won't protect you from big lapses in judgment. In fact, you're probably more susceptible. You can have people who have a lot of raw brain power. Their IQ is incredibly high, but they don't have the right checks and balances in their thinking. Slip-ups of the smugly smart set next. It's skeptic check, warrior mentality on Big Picture Science. been talking in this episode of Skeptic Check on Big Picture Science about how to sort out rational and irrational worries. 
But there's another factor that can complicate how well you do that. What if your rationality and intelligence gets in the way of being rational and intelligent? I'm David Robson. I'm the author of The Intelligence Trap, which looks at why smart people act stupidly and how we can avoid their mistakes. And that is basically his subtitle, Why Smart People Make Dumb Mistakes. The inspiration for this book really came from my work as a science journalist. And, you know, I came across loads of really clever scientists who acted incredibly stupidly. Um, One of the most notable examples, I think, was Kerry Mullis, who really invented some of the processes that are absolutely essential for genetic testing. But he also has some really strange views on things like astrology and climate change. He's a climate change denier. And he also denied the link between the HIV virus and AIDS, which is a very dangerous belief to have. Dave Robson says the intelligence trap lies in wait to snag the brainiest among us who have confidence in their expertise or just all-around smarts. That truck is not going to make it past those cars. Yes, it is. Look, that truck is, what, uh, two meters from the cars? And the truck weighs, I don't know, seven tons? So the kinetic energy is only 30 joules. No way he's going to hit those cars. What? You're a neurosurgeon. Look, trust me on this. You can have people who have a lot of raw brain power. Their IQ is incredibly high. They can also be educated and have lots of professional expertise. But they don't have the right checks and balances in their thinking. And their intelligence can actually amplify and exaggerate their mistakes. Well, you'd think that very intelligent people, and we'll get to the notion of intelligence in a moment, would also be the most rational. Why isn't that the case? I think there are lots of mechanisms at work here. Some intelligent people are cognitive misers, which means that they're kind of lazy thinkers. They maybe have the capacity to think rationally, but they just don't really apply that very often. They go with their gut instincts and their emotions rather than that rational thinking. Now, there are other reasons. So one important one is this idea of earned dogmatism. And that's just this idea that if you become an expert in a subject, you assume you know everything there is to know about it. And so you're less open to new evidence and new ideas that might contradict those findings. Um, and that's definitely seen in politics amongst like political pundits. Um, you actually see the most experienced political pundits are often the worst at predicting the results of an election, possibly because they have this earned dogmatism. So intelligent people are uh, certain of their choices and uh, consequently may not step back and reflect on their decision making. Uh, People have observed that Steve Jobs, for example, might be alive today had he not defied, you know, the common medical practice and and went with alternative remedies for his cancer. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, another example is this one of Arthur Conan Doyle, you know, the famous author. He was also a a physician as well, you know, so he had a scientific background. And the Sherlock Holmes books really demonstrate that he really understood the logical process. But he also believed in spiritualism. He believed in ghosts. He believed in uh, fairies, even thanks to some kind of hoax at the time. And there you really see that it was a combination of motivated reasoning and and dogmatism that meant that he just didn't listen to any arguments that contradicted his point of view. He would just use his intelligence to demolish anyone that disagreed with him. Do you notice any uh, sex difference in in this sort of behavior? I mean, you know, when I think of people who are smart people but uh, hold to kind of goofy ideas. They're, they're all men, and I wonder whether women are better at this than men. Mm, yeah, you know, I don't know of lots of scientific research that has examined that proposition. But yeah, anecdotally, I would agree with you. I would say, though, that there is some important sex difference in another kind of element that I discuss, and that's looking at group dynamics. So there's lots of work showing that actually the average IQ of a group doesn't matter so much for their performance or their problem solving as other measures of the group dynamics, such as their emotional sensitivity to each other or the way they kind of discuss how equal the discussion is between all of the participants. Now, the interesting thing that you see there is that groups made up of all men perform significantly worse than groups made up of mostly women. And that appears to be because men 
probably because of the kind of cultures that we live in, do have this tendency to try to dominate the discussion rather than listening to other points of view, whereas the groups made up of women do have this better, more equal group dynamic that actually allows everyone to contribute their own intelligence and expertise to the problem at hand. And we're talking about uh, how smart people make dumb mistakes, but how do we define what a smart person is? I mean, what's the definition of intelligence that's current these days? Right. Yeah, that's a really great question. So, I mean, I think the definition of intelligence really is based on this research from a 100 years ago or more that kind of inspired the intelligence test. And, you know, IQ tests have been criticised a lot, but actually they do measure some really important skills. They measure your abstract thinking, your kind of learning and memory, your ability to reason non-verbally. Now, those IQ tests do correlate very well with your success at school, which should be expected because they were, in fact, designed to predict academic success. But they do also predict other things such as job performance in lots of careers, especially those that do need to have this kind of abstract reasoning. So things like science or medicine or law, you know, anything that kind of requires you to think of complex, abstract ideas. You know, I do believe that we really should keep that definition of intelligence. And what I'm trying to argue is that we also need to consider other elements of thinking that complement intelligence. So things like rational thinking and wisdom, which may sound like a kind of floaty philosophical concept, but now there's some very good science showing that you can measure wise reasoning as opposed to intelligent reasoning. So when smart people show a lapse in judgment, I mean, could it be that their emotions are steering them wrong? You know, you could be pretty smart and still not like snakes or spiders or, or flying or, you know, maybe you're worried about rocks from space wiping you out, that kind of thing. Or you could just make a stupid decision when you're in love. So, I mean, is it a surprise that smart people may exhibit this irrationality? Yeah, that's a really good point, because obviously everyone experiences strong emotional feelings. And you wouldn't necessarily expect intelligent people to be less susceptible to that. But what I think I have found is that when they experience this kind of strong emotional pull, their intelligence can actually fuel their decision making in a way that actually makes them even more wrong because of that. So political decision making, where your kind of strong feelings about your political identity can prevent you from reasoning rationally about different issues like climate change or gun control. And the idea here is that everyone would experience that kind of emotional pull that might make them fall down on an issue one way or the other. But people's intelligence actually makes them more polarised. So the more intelligent and educated they are, the more polarised they are on those issues. It's like the combination of the intelligence and emotion is really amplifying an error in judgment on certain issues. And I think you can almost certainly see that in your private life as well, or same business. If your career is failing, rather than serving you well, your intelligence might just help you to rationalise a mistake and continue your error rather than pulling back and realising that it's time to admit defeat or change tactic altogether. Well, finally, Dave. So it seems that even intelligent people can make stupid mistakes... But, uh, Dave, you provide some tips that we can all use to act more wisely. It's a cognitive toolkit for anyone to protect against misinformation. What are some of your ideas? That's right. So since we've just been talking about emotions, I would say that one of the most powerful ways to improve your wisdom to avoid these mistakes is to be more aware of your emotions, to be more emotionally sensitive to the way that your feelings are directing your decision making. Um, and there are lots of ways you can do that. So there's some evidence that reflective practices like meditation can just help you to tune in to your feelings before they lead you astray. So you kind of notice when they're pulling you in one direction and you account for that. But there are other methods. And one of my favourites is this skill called emotion differentiation. Now, some people are just better at labelling their emotions and recognising exactly how they feel. They use more precise language when talking about how they feel. And there's really good evidence that that can improve your decision making in all areas. But to give just one example, they found that traders on the stock market who have better emotion differentiation tend to make wiser investments. And that, again, is because it just helps them to account for 
any irrational emotion that might be leading them astray. So, for example, if they've made a big loss and they're feeling a lot of regret about that, if you're more able to kind of put a label on that, you're less likely to then turn that regret into like a rash decision afterwards to try to win back your money. You're more likely to maybe step back and to regulate those feelings. And that is a trainable skill and it can be trained with you know, just a few minutes each day, just trying to really look inside yourself, pin down your emotions, describe how you're feeling. And over time, you'll find that that has a powerful effect on your decision making. Dave Robson, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Dave Robson is the author of The Intelligence Trap, Why Smart People Make Dumb Mistakes. So what we're hearing in the show is that Uh, It's not always easy to figure out what we should worry about and what we shouldn't worry about, but even the brainiest of the brainiest among us have trouble making that distinction. Yeah. In a way, I wasn't so surprised to hear that because, you know, if you're brainy, you tend to be arrogant. And it's not just about, you know, gauging whether you should be afraid of this, that, or the other and misjudging statistics. You know, you figure that the only opinion that counts is your opinion. Don't you find it ironic that you didn't find any of that surprising? You already knew it? Yes, I, I, I knew it. And it's because of my uh, inherent braininess. Right, it's right over here in a jar. When's the last time you had a big lapse of judgment? Oh, probably this afternoon. I mean, I don't know. I, there, there are lots of lapses of judgment, but I think the worst ones are the ones you don't notice for two days, you know, at, at which point it's impossible to fix anything. But I must say that what we've heard in this show, I mean, it is very interesting that we consider ourselves rational. And in fact, we're, you know, we're making decisions, I guess, the way our four apes did, you know, uh, when they were living in the trees. I guess that's the case. What I find interesting is that even when we have the facts and even if we know that we shouldn't be worried about X, whatever it may be, it's hard to let go of those worries. I mean, you know, the worry machine is not like a light switch. You can't just turn it off. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so, you know, we're trying to get people to worry less by being rational with them. So somewhat <laughs> oxymoronic or simply self-contradictory because <laughs> if they if they were totally rational, then we wouldn't have to tell them that they're being irrational. Of course, we don't want people to worry more because they're not worrying less. That is not the message of this episode. Well, if it is, it uh, went right over my windshield. We have few worries putting together this show, thanks to the production help of senior producer Gary Niederhoff, assistant producer Sarah Derwin, and operations manager Barbara Vance. I am executive producer Molly Bentley. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit education and research organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including the formation of our solar system. I'm the Institute's senior astronomer astronomer, Seth Shostak, but that's nothing to worry about. Also, a big thanks to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to our regular episode of Critical Thinking, Skeptic Check on Big Picture Science, this episode, Worrier Mentality. If you want to hear more Big Picture Science, well, you'll find past episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. Our website also has links to the guests you heard. You may be listening to our radio show, but did you know we're also a podcast? And you can make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to Bye Bye Sci on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, or Himalaya. Skeptic Check is brought to you thanks to a generous grant from the Trimberger Family Foundation. At the Trimberger Family Foundation, we hold that skepticism is a lamp that lights the way to truth. Trimberger.org.